before we start this video, a large thank you to KiraCat, Alex, a name I unfortunately cannot pronounce. Thank you for the support, my friend. I wonder how many times I've said that in the last three years. Adria and Benjamin for their support. I hope you guys enjoy the video. And a special thank you to Halo Burner for their immense support of the channel this month on Patreon. It really means the most, man. I hope you enjoy the video. Hello, everybody. And today we're going to implement our lock-on system, or I will say we're going to start it because it's going to be pretty lengthy. So I'm going to open up my inputs right now and just add a button right away. And I'm just going to call this lock on. I'm going to call it lock on because honestly, there's nothing else in this series we'll be using this for. So if you want to call it uh, right stick click or whatever, just some name as long as you know what it is, right stick down or right stick press. We're going to use the right stick press on the gamepad. If you're using a keyboard and mouse, you can set it up for some other key if you'd like. So next, let's go into our input manager here and let's actually open this up and uh, we're going to make an input for this as we normally would. So let's make a header. I'm just going to call this lock on input. And since it is kind of close to the camera, I'm going to put it right below the camera because I feel like it just belongs there. So for now, we just need the one bool serializable field bool lock on input. And I'm going to put an underscore after input because I see I've done that with the right bumper input. And now that I'm looking at it, it's kind of bothering me that not everything is the same. So I'm going to quickly fix that off camera and just add an underscore next to all of these inputs. Okay, now that that's done, I'm going to go down to on enable and I'm going to just copy everything here from the RB input because it's a button so it behaves the same way. And I'm just going to change RB to lock on and I'm going to change RB input to lock on input. All right, that is all we need here. I'm going to make a comment just for a lock on. So when we add like 20 inputs in the future, if you're quickly scrolling through, you can really easily catch it if you need to change something. And I'm going to place this where I'm going to put it. So I guess I'll just put it on top for now. I'm going to make a private void handle lock on input. So I'm going to comment this out and we're going to take this very slow because this is a lot of steps and independently, they're actually pretty straightforward and very easy to understand. But if you look at it all together, it kind of get overwhelming. So we're going to take this really slow. We're going to say if lock on input, lock on input is equal to false. So the input does not repeat. Let's make some comments. What do we want to do? Well, we want to attempt to lock on, but in order to do that, we need to know if we're already locked on. And I'm going to make this uh, or call this rather under our handle all inputs, because if I don't do it now, I'm going to forget. So we need to know if we're locked on already and we need to know if we have a target. So we need to say, are we already locked on? And if we are, we want to unlock. And if we're not locked on, we want to attempt to lock on. I say attempt because you want to have a target. And we're going to say, is our current target dead? If we are, under any circumstances, we want to unlock or try to seek a new target. So these are just two things right now we'll put on the uh, the most important list. And because these come first when you're attempting to lock on. So in order to deal with the first problem, let's actually go over now to our character network manager and let's make a flag for if we're locked on. This needs to be a network variable because you need to know if other people are locked on because that's how you know if they're using their strafing movement or not. Because as you know, in Elden Ring and Dark Souls, if you're locked on, your movement changes from a forward movement to a strafe movement. So let's go next to the character manager. And I guess now that I'm saying this out loud, we could kind of put this on the character combat manager instead. So let's jump over there. Let's go over to the character combat manager and open that up. And let's make a variable that will be a type character manager for the current target that we're locked onto. Okay. I'm gonna give this a header. Um, so this is going to be attack type and this will be attack target. That'll be the two headers we have here. So current target is in yes, the, the target you are locked on to fight. Okay. Now that we have that, we can expand a little bit upon this handle lock on input function. So what are we going to do? Well, we can come down here and deal with the is our target dead. This should be the first thing we check all the time. This doesn't need us to check if our lock on input is pressed or not, because this should be ran constantly. So above that, we're going to say if player dot player network manager dot is locked on. So if we are in fact locked on, this means we likely have a target. So let's check for dead target. So if we are locked on, let's say if player dot player combat manager dot current target does not equal null because you could be locked on and the target could for some reason be null. Maybe it got destroyed or something happened. So we're going to say if the player 
dot player combat manager dot current target is dead. So we would say dot is dead. And let's make this easier to understand by writing it in a shorthand sense so it's cleaner. So we're going to say if the target is dead dot value, we're going to do some logic, but back up here, instead of saying if the current target is not equal null, let's say if it is null and just say return. So return out of this if statement. Okay, so then we're going to say player dot player network manager dot is locked on dot value is equal to false. And you don't have to check for ownership here because you only run these functions on the input manager. So it's only on your local player anyway. And after that, we want to either attempt to find a new target or unlock completely, but that's not important right now. So let's go down here to lock on input. Now, are we already locked on? So we can deal with this now. If lock on input and the player network manager dot is locked on dot value, then we want to basically just unlock. That's it. But we're not going to deal with that either right now. We're going to finish writing out this core function. So we're just going to make a comment here saying disable lock on. And the last part of this core function, we can even return from that if you want, is if the lock on input has been pressed and we're not locked on, then we're going to attempt to lock on and find a target. And that's it for this main input here, for this core uh, logic of this input. So now we can actually start writing the lock on logic itself. So I'm just going to change this to enable lock on. But before we do that, I want to give us a visual to better understand how this is going to work. I think it'll be really good at kind of nailing home the logic we're going to go for. So let's make a comment here too before we do that. Uh, in the future, if we're aiming or using a range weapon like a bow, we don't want to allow lock on. So just simply return. Just need to insert that there because I might forget until the time comes. Okay, so if we're using a range weapon, you want to return out of this function, you do not want to enable lock on. So now we can jump over to the player camera manager and we can make our function handle locating lock on targets. Okay, now let's take a look at that visual that I just mentioned. Okay, so now we have one character on the screen. Obviously, if we click lock on, they're going to be our target. Now, if we have two on the screen, the character to our right is still going to be our target because they are closer to us, okay? Now, if we're already locked on to the character to the right, and then this character appears, if we move the stick to the left, then this target over here will be our next target and not the one over here on the far left. Now, why is this? This is because we're checking our lock on target respective to the one we're already locked onto, but only on one axis. So basically we're checking for our next target when we move the stick to the left on the left and right axis. We're not considering the other axes for how close they are to us. And since this middle person is closer on the left and right axis to the person on the right, our current target, then the character over here on the far left, this will be our next target if we move the stick left, providing they are not out of our maximum lock on range. They can be back way further, uh, and this target on the left could be even be closer. But we're going to check our next target, like I said before, in respect to the distance of our current target. Now, if you're not locked on at all, the target on the right will be your target first, because again, they are the closest one to you. So if you're locked on to the target to the right, and then you move to the left, you go to the middle target. And then if you to the left again, then you go to the far left target. Okay, so... Let's go back into our scene here now, and I'm just going to create a visual for you really quickly and drag in a couple of people to really hit this home. When I say left and right axes, I mean the transform up there, that component, and the position, and I mean the X axes, okay? So the X axis is gonna be your left and right axis. So if I am this person back here, or you're this person back here, and we have a couple targets locked on, um, basically, I'm gonna write these variables to show you what I mean first. So we, we would measure by shortest distance so this one is the one that you're going to find first so we'd say this is starts off at math f dot infinity and this is later going to change depending on how many targets you find it's going to pick the one who's the closest to you the player okay and then we have shortest distance from the right and shortest distance from the left now these come into account if you're already locked on and they're used to find the next potential target that's the closest to the left and the closest to the right of the current target. And the reason we initialize on math f infinity is so you can always get something closer when you find anything at all. Now, it, since left on the x axis is negative, you actually want to initialize it at math f infinity minus. So it will be minus 
mathf.infinity. And this is why I wanted to show you in game. I'm going to drop back here now when I'm done making these comments. It's going to say will be used to determine the shortest distance on one axis to the right of the target. And then we can make the left. But if I go back into the game here now and click on any of these targets, so I'm just going to click on low poly man. You know what? Let's actually just set this up as if we're actually locked on. So I'm going to name this closest one my current lock on target. Let's really use this visual again in game. And if you want to fast forward, if you want to understand it, you totally can. I'm just going to do this real quick. So we have our current target. I'm going to duplicate this guy and put one over here. And then I'm going to put one a little bit. Clay. Let's move them all to the left so we're not completely off the plane. Uh, so then I will duplicate this one and move it down and then to the right. So even though this one on the far right is closer uh, in terms of distance, this one would be our next target because it's closer to the current target on the right axis than the one a little bit further away. Okay, so again, current target, next target, and then if you hit right again, this will be your last target. So I would say this would not be your next target. So now if I were to go back up here to our target, you can see if I go to the x-axis, I move it backwards, or sorry, to the left, it goes down into the negative values. If I move it to the right, it goes into the positive values. So for that reason, when we initialize our uh, closest left distance, we're using at negative dot infinity and not infinity, okay? Now, we're not using these variables in this video. We're going to use them in the next video. We're going to keep this video super simple. We're just going to handle getting the closest target to us. But they're going to come into play, and I wanted to explain them because I want you to really think on that if you don't understand why we're doing it. Um, try to be as clear as possible. So if you have any concerns, just let me know in the comments. I can go over it again in the next installment. So float shortest distance of left target is going to be equal to negative math f dot infinity. Okay. And like I said before, again, the reason we use infinity is because if we find anything at all, it's going to be closer than this variable. So you want to make this variable infinity because we don't really have a shortest distance of target until we can compare a couple. And this is going to change every time you find a target that is shorter. I'm going to make a comment here saying will be used to determine shortest distance on one axis to the left of the current target minus and then on the right of the current target is plus on the x axis. Okay, so now that that is out of the way, let's actually get to the logic of locating our closest target. We're going to make a collider array and we're going to call this colliders and we're going to initialize this by saying equals physics dot overlap sphere. This just draws a sphere around the player dot transform position because that's the position we give it. And we need a radius. So let's actually make a lock on sphere radius variable. I'm going to make a header up here. Lock on. And I'm going to make a serializable field for private lock on radius. It's supposed to be a float. And I'm going to show this something like 20. You can play around with this. It's not super important um, until you actually get into testing your game. You want to see how it feels in your levels and such. So I'm going to say lock on radius here. Now, I'm going to make it to do here. We're going to add a layer mask so we're not wasting uh, memory. So we want to only use this on the layer that consists of players. Otherwise, you're just scanning every collider within a 20 uh, unit radius and you're kind of just wasting memory there for no reason. We're going to come back to that in a bit. So next, let's make a for loop and let's iterate through all of these colliders. And then we're going to say character manager. We can call this lock on target is equal to colliders i as in whichever collider in this list we're currently on dot get component character manager and then if that character manager is not null we want to do some logic we have to run this by a bunch of parameters to see if this is a potential lock on target for us so let's make a note here check if they are within our field of view Okay, so vector three lock on target direction is equal to our lock on target dot transform dot position minus the player dot transform dot position. That gets their direction in respect to our player's object. Next, let's make a float for distance from the target, and we can initialize that at vector three dot distance, and we can check the distance from again our player object and then the lock on target's object position. Okay, and lastly, we can use our lock on target direction now to get an angle for the field of view. So we're going to say float viewable angle is equal to 
vector three dot angle and we pass inside of this our lock on target direction and the camera object transform dot forward because we're using the camera to see. So we're going to say if our lock on target dot is dead dot value, we want to simply continue with this for loop and check for other potential targets. So if you don't know, using continue just makes the loop go on, but basically ignores what would come next for this specific entry in the loop. So then we're going to say if lock on target dot transform dot root is equal to the player transform dot root, that means you accidentally tried to lock on to yourself. We want to continue because we can't lock on to ourself. And if you want to make a comment here too, let's do that. So it's very clear. If our target is dead, check the next potential target. And if our target is us, check the next potential target. Now, I guess you could also probably say if the character manager equals and then cast it as a player manager uh, equals the player manager on your character, you can do that. But I like using transmount root because that's a lot more simple and doesn't require a cast. All right, so let's make a couple more parameters on lock on. We want our field of view, right? You don't want to be the lock on something that's outside of your field of view. So we're going to say private float. We're going to make one for minimum. I guess I can get rid of private because we have serializable fields. So we'll keep the conventions here the same for naming. So minimum viewable angle, I'm going to say minus 50 and maximum viewable angle, I'm going to say plus 50. And you probably want to tweak these a little bit. Depends on how you feel. I'm just throwing these numbers out here. I know they work pretty well, but if you want something a bit wider, then you can make the minimum lower and the maximum higher. Okay. So down here now, we're going to make sure we're not outside of the bounds of this viewable angle. So if viewable angle is greater than minimum viewable angle and it's less than the maximum viewable angle you could say greater or equal to by the way or less than or equal to if you want to include that number um, then we know we've passed the check so we're good so i'm going to go back up here again now and we're going to make a distance check because maybe you don't want to lock on to a target that's a certain distance away from your character so I'm just going to say 20, again, a random number here, not thinking too much about it. You'll have to change these when you actually get into designing your levels and testing that stuff. So before we do the viewable angle check, I'm going to do a check for the distance. So we're going to say if the distance from target is greater than the maximum lock on distance, continue. This target is not a potential target, so continue checking through the other targets. So again, if the target's too far away, then it cannot be added as a, as a potential target. And this is what this list is. We're checking for a list of potential targets. Okay. Now down here, if we pass the viewable angle check, we have one more check. Let's make a ray cast hit variable. It's called hit. And then let's do a line cast. Now, what is a line cast? A line cast simply returns true if something blocks um, basically this ray cast between the destinations leaving and the target destination. So it checks for an obstruction basically. Now we don't want to fire this in the player.transform because that'll fire from the feet because it'll be at the base of the player's game object. We want to fire it from one of two places. I'm going to give us two options here and I'll tell you what I do and why. So the first option is probably honestly a little bit better in some circumstances. You want to go to the head, specifically the eyes of the character and make a empty transform and call this your line cast transform. And then it will shoot a line cast from the eyes to the lock on transform or the eyes of the character you're attempting to lock onto. And if nothing obstructs it, you have a potential target, but I am going to use the lock on transform. So we're going to add a transform to our character. Usually I put it somewhere under the spine three near the heart. And this is line cast option two. This is the lock on transform. This is the transform that you look at when you're locked onto a character. I like doing my line cast from here because it makes sense to me that your lock on transform has to match up with their lock on transform to see them as a target. You can use the eyes. Um, like I said, both are totally valid. Use somewhere else completely if you want um, somewhere else on the character. I mean, but I'm going to use the lock on transform. So because of that, let's actually make our lock on transform variable because this is again is going to be required anyway, as this is what you're going to force the camera to stare at when you're locked on. So this is just going to be a transform on your player model. So go to your character manager. And again, actually, you know what? I guess I could put this on the character combat manager um, now that I'm thinking about it. So we're going to go there instead. It makes more sense to be over here. So I'm going to make a header for lock on transform. 
Now, if you don't want to drag this in for every model you have, um, if you change the models over and over again, you could make a script called lock on transform and just put it on a random object in your, uh, in your model and then use on awake get component in children and then just reference the transform of your script. The script would just be completely blank basically. But I'm going to do it the old fashioned way and I'm going to make a transform here. So uh, I think this target is actually on the model that I supplied for the series. I kind of forget what it's for. I might have put it there for the lock on transform or it might be there because of something Rob did with the animations. I'm going to leave it. You could just use that if you want, but I'm going to make a new one, call it lock on target, and I'm going to drag it outside of spine three, just right here, and then put it down next to target. I'm going to reset the transforms on it, specifically the rotation, the position is fine. And uh, yeah, we're good to go. So now I can drag this in, in the inspector inside our player combat manager. Now, a few people asked me how I had a dummy in the scene last time. I'm going to show you how to set that up as well. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so let's drag in our lock on transform. We're going to test things with a dummy from now on for a while until we uh, test it for online to make sure it works because it's just a lot quicker. Now, if we go back to the player camera, we could say if player phys or sorry, if physics dot line cast player combat manager lock on transform dot position lock on target dot character combat manager dot transform dot position or dot lock on transform dot position. So basically, if it makes it there, we're going to pass our out hit ray cast. We're good. And if it doesn't, then we're not good. So also a to-do list, we're gonna make this only check for the environmental layer. So you don't wanna check for the character layer or else it might not work. You wanna make sure it checks the environment layer only. Okay. Now, we're gonna use a layer mask for this. So to-do, add a layer mask for environmental layers only. Now, if it does hit something, we have hit something. This has failed. This target cannot be a potential target. Otherwise, we're going to add this target to our list of potential targets. And then in the next episode, that list is going to be used to determine which one's the closest to us. And then we're going to use that list again to determine which is the closest uh, to the left and right of the current target. So we say continue if we hit that line cast, else we throw a debug.log, we made it. Okay, I'm gonna, this is important, add the debug.log so you can test it in the game because we're going to do that momentarily. So let's save that. Now let's go over here and I'm going to create an empty game object and I'm going to call this the world utility manager. And ooh, it's another world manager. This is going to be very useful for this series. We're going to go back to this so much. So let's add a script called world utility manager. Let's do the, the thing we always do where we delete the start and update as is per tradition. We throw in a namespace. And, and since this is a world manager, we're going to make this a singleton because there's only should ever be one in the scene and we're going to make it persistent. Now I'm going to say if instance is equal to null, then I'm going to say instance is equal to this else debug or sorry, else destroy game object. So if this already exists, destroy it. If not, the instance is equal to this. Now let's make a serializable field for the layer mask. And I'm going to call this the character layers. And let's make a serializable field for the environmental layers. So layer mask again going to call this enviro layers. And now we make two public functions. I'm going to add my header here for layers because we're probably going to have more of these in the future. We definitely are. I'm going to make two public functions here of type layer mask. going to call it get character layers. And I'm going to call the next one get enviro layers. And I'm just going to return character layers. And then I'm going to return enviro layers. And now we go back to our player camera and we just add in these two functions where we have a layer mask. So I'm going to go over here now to our rule utility manager first, drag it as a prefab. So that's saved and we set up the character layers. The character layers are character and damageable character and the environmental layers for me are just default. That's typically what I use. You can make it its own layer if you want, but everything comes into the scene with default. So I like using default. Now I'm going to say right here, world utility manager dot instance dot get enviro layers. And that's on the check for the line cast. I'm going to, Press enter a couple of times so you can see it. it's not off screen. And then up here, I'm going to do um, the character layers right here. So where we're doing the physics dot overlap sphere world utility manager dot instance dot get character layers. Okay, excellent. Let's save that. Now I'm going to go into game, grab my player, drag him to the scene. I'm going to unpack the prefab and rename him to dummy and make a new prefab. Now guys, all you got to do is literally replace everything that says player with the character version of its script. 
So the base class, okay? Player inventory manager becomes character inventory manager. Player stats manager becomes character stats manager. And then you got this. Now make sure you also don't forget to drag in your lock on transform again. Otherwise, you might have a problem here. So I'm going to do that and then make this its own prefab like so. And now we're basically good to go. Next, let's go over to the handle lock on input. Let's call player camera dot instance dot handle locating lock on targets. All right, let's save that. And now let's minimize this going to the scene, dragging your dummy. You might want to hit spawn here on the network object because we don't have a script to do that yet. And now let's go and look away from him and press the lock on input. And you can see nothing happens. That's good. That means we're not accidentally locked on to, but as I get closer, if I keep hitting the button, it's still not locking on, it's still not locking on, and it is now locking on. So you can see there he's in our field of view, he's within our distance, and he's within the radius. Now, if I were to go behind this object and try to lock on, you can see it doesn't work, even though he's within the camera's view. But if I come out from behind this object, the obstruction, you can see the debug log fires again, and we made it, he is a potential target. So guys, we have a method now of locating a target based on our field of view, based on the distance from the character in respect to the forward direction of the camera as well. So in the next episode, we're going to make a list of potential targets, and then we're going to basically lock the camera onto the closest target we find and actually set up the camera's logic for what it does when we're actually locked on. We're also going to handle switching the, the target every time your lock on target changes. And by the target, I mean the current target in the character combat manager. And we might get into actually also changing our locomotion when we're locked on as well. All right. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you learned something here today and I will see you guys next week. I hope you all have a lovely weekend.